Welcome to Grace Church Online. We're so glad you're here. My name is Erin. When you have a minute, we'd love if you'd fill out the Digital Connect card that you can find as a link in the description of this broadcast. It's a great way to let us know you're here. If you'd like to spread the word about Grace Church, go ahead and click that share button and start a watch party. That'll let all your friends know that you're here with us at Grace this morning. Hey parents, Kids of Grace resources are available for you and your family. Just look in the description of this broadcast below. There you're going to find the link for the Parent Q app, as well as links for other videos for your kiddos to watch. Let's join together this morning as we point our hearts together towards God in worship. Well, welcome. My name is Kevin Brushard. I'm the worship arts pastor here at Grace, and uh, we just want to take a minute to prepare our hearts for worship. Um, And so no matter where you are, whether you're watching on a computer screen, some of you may be taking a walk, some of you may be sitting in your living room with your families, wherever you are, I just want to encourage you to just close your eyes. We're going to pray, but just go ahead and just put your hands out in front of you. And we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to come and to, to, to be present in our midst. Uh, when we put our hands out like this, it's a, it's a symbol of receiving from the Lord. And so let's just put our hands out like this and let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are here, that you are present, that you are moving, that you are breathing, that you are um, doing things in our midst. Lord, we may not always recognize those things. We may not be always attentive to those things. But God, right now we pause we take a deep breath and we recognize that you are here, that you are real, that you are breathing and moving all around us. And so as that is happening, God, we, we turn our eyes to you. In fact, we turn away from the distractions. We turn away from the evil and the sin in our lives and in this world. And we turn our eyes towards you and, and, and we, we cast our gaze upon you. Lord, because we want to see the things of you. We want to see the things of your kingdom here today. So as we sing these songs, I pray that your healing touch would come, that it would touch our lives, that it would touch our bodies, that that we would feel healing, that we would feel relief, that we will feel thirst being quenched. Lord, you are so good and you are so faithful. And Lord, we trust you today. We press in to your spirit and we ask for you to move in our midst in your name. Amen. Daily I'm constrained 
strength to be let thy grace lord like a feather bind my wandering heart to thee and prone to
my life. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you. So as we continue our worship this morning, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We want to take a minute and let you know a few things that are happening here at Grace this week. Make sure to download the Grace app if you haven't already. It's available on the Android and the Apple App Store. The app will help keep you in the know about most of the things that are happening at Grace. Last week, we introduced our new partners in ministry. Some of you might be wondering, what is a partner in ministry? Well, here at Grace, we're not looking for church members. We're looking for folks who want to partner with us in the ministry that God's given us here in Gainesville. If you've been hanging out at Grace for a little while and you want to know more, just send an email to lifegroups at gracefl.org. Are you looking for a great way that you can make a difference in our community? Grace would like to sponsor 57 families with swag, but we need your help. For just $12, we'll provide a family of four a week's supply of food from the bread of the mighty to each of these families. If you're interested in sponsoring one or several family boxes, please pay online or mail a check to the church office. Grace is also continuing our diaper drive for swag. If you'd like to donate diapers, you can drop them off at the church office put them under the chapel entrance overhang. If you have any questions, email missions at gracefl.org. 
Kids of Grace is having a Zoom talent show this upcoming Friday, June 12th at 6.30. All talents are welcomed and encouraged. Children can perform by themselves or you can get the whole family involved. Follow the link in the description to sign up. Submissions deadline is this Tuesday. Thanks so much for tuning in with us this week. Have a good one. Good morning, Grace Church. My name is Nick Sandora. I have been one of the volunteers with Grace Student Ministries over the last three years. Uh, I wanted to wish you a happy June. Um, I am here to introduce and let you guys know of some very special students that have graduated or are getting ready to graduate uh, from Grace Student Ministries and from the Grace family. Our first senior we would like to congratulate is Grace Catherine Aiden. Grace recently graduated from St. Francis Catholic Academy and will attend Florida State University in the fall. She plans to major in exercise physiology and hopes to continue to PA school in the future. Her favorite verse in scripture is Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Grace was an active member in the student ministries, which allowed her to be able to connect with people and build amazing friendships. Last summer, Grace went to Kenya and had an incredible experience that fueled her faith journey. Congratulations, Grace. Our next senior we would like to congratulate is Miguel Angel Yepes. Miguel recently graduated from St. Francis Catholic Academy and will attend Stetson University in the fall. He plans to major in biology and minor in business with hopes to become an orthopedic PA. His favorite verse in scripture is Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Miguel was an active member in the student ministries. He was not super religious until he found grace, so he is thankful that the church strengthened his faith. Congratulations, Miguel. Our next senior we would like to congratulate is Mason Luther McElroy. Mason recently graduated from Oak Hall School and will attend North Carolina Wesleyan College to play baseball in the fall. He plans to major in business with future plans to become a sports agent. His favorite verse in scripture is also Philippians 4 verse 13. Mason loves that grace has been a part of his life and is thankful for many opportunities to experience mission trips. He values the kindness and generosity of people that attend this church. Congratulations, Mason. Our next senior we would like to congratulate is Liam Edward Edinger. Liam recently graduated from Newberry High School and will attend the University of Central Florida in the fall where he plans to study physical therapy. Go PT. His favorite verse in scripture is also Philippians 4 verse 13. Liam believes that grace has impacted his faith journey in many ways. He feels that the church has brought him closer to the Lord and has helped him understand the depth of his faith. Going through confirmation taught him to become more confident in his faith and allowed him to live his life as more authentic Christian. Congratulations, Liam. Our next senior we would like to congratulate is Joshua Robert Thompson. Josh recently graduated from Florida Virtual School and will attend Atlanta Institute of Music and Media in the fall. He plans to focus on playing guitar and learning about music production with future plans of forming his own band. His favorite verse in scripture is 1 Peter verse 6 through 7. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proving genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Josh was an active member of the student ministries and believes that this has greatly impacted and will continue to impact his relationship with God. He also served on the worship band each Sunday, which helped him realize that he can worship God no matter what he is going through. Congratulations, Josh. Our next senior we would like to congratulate is Kate Elizabeth Krauser. Kate recently graduated from Oak Hall School and will attend Berry College to play lacrosse in the fall. 
she plans to double major in finance and math with a concentration in computer science. Her favorite verse in scripture is Proverbs 31, verse 26. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is her own tongue. Kate was an active member of the student ministries where she met some of her best friends and found lots of people that were so supportive. She attended mission trips to Nashville and Kenya where she learned of God's love and had some amazing experiences. Congratulations, Kate. Our last senior we would like to congratulate is Natalie Ann Oyenarte. Natalie recently graduated from Gainesville High School and will attend Vanderbilt University in the fall where she plans to major in biomedical engineering. Her favorite verse in scripture is Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Natalie has been attending Grace since she was a baby. She was baptized at the church, which helped her grow spiritually. She values the weekly services, worship dance, Sunday school, and volunteering at VBS. She wants to thank the entire Grace community for helping her achieve her dreams. Congratulations, Natalie. Man, it's been a crazy year. I want to thank the seniors uh, for devoting your time to this church. Um, we, as a, a church family, will be here with you. We will be praying for you. And we are here to, to help walk you through this, this next journey of your life. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. Um, we wish you the best of luck. God bless. Grace Church, this is uh, the time of the service where we're going to give back to God what he's already given to us. And uh, some people think of that as being an extra part of the service or something that lies outside of our, our gathered time of worship, but it's not. It's actually an act of worship. And so in just a moment, you'll see on your screen the various ways that we can give uh, so that the ministry that we're doing uh, can continue in Gainesville and around the world. But let me say this. This is the first Sunday of the month. On the first Sunday of the month, just this year, we instituted a special offering that we're asking folks to give above and beyond your tithe, and that is for benevolence. And let me tell you that so far, you have given so much that we have been able to help people in our church. Um, I think we're about up to about $10,000 right around there that we've been able to help people people uh, because there are many, many folks who are struggling right now. So if you would give in that way above and beyond your tithe, you can, uh, there'll be a drop down and you just hit benevolence right there. Uh, for those of you who would like to take us up on receiving some of that help, all you have to do is email Ted Grusser and his email address is missions at gracefl.org and say, I just want to take you up on the offer. Uh, uh, it's very confidential. Nobody knows except for the, the, the people here in the office who are working with you. Uh, but again, people have been helped by your uh, generosity. So thank you and know that that is there for you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? God, we thank you for this church. We thank you that even though we can't get together physically yet, and we are looking forward to that day. In the meantime, we are still able to work together. And by giving to you your tithes and our offerings, we're able to help one another and to make sure that the ministry continues here in our community and around the world. Bless this giving, Lord, that you might use it in order to build your kingdom and to bring people to Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to Grace Church Online. Whether this is the first time you have ever worshiped with us or you have been joining us for the last several months, 
We are glad that you are here. My name is Levi Lowry. I'm the assistant pastor here at Grace, and we are finishing up a series called Courage Over Fear. And so we have been spending some time in the book of Joshua looking at this idea of courage over fear. Fear. Now, if you've missed all the other weeks, just head on back. You can look at Facebook, our app. You can watch it on YouTube and get caught up. But we're going to finish this series out with a bang today. And I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever been frustrated by a, a bait and switch type of situation? Or maybe, maybe not even really a bait and switch, but Perhaps it's a situation where you went into it expecting one thing, but you ended up getting another. Now, I'm going to start out pretty trivial here, but I don't know about you. Our family has been trying to support local restaurants during this time, and something as small as a a to-go order can bring this idea of expecting one thing, but getting another to light. Now, I know that for some of you, a burger is not really a burger until there's a a big old hunk of tomato and it's just glopped down with, with mayonnaise. Now for me, nothing ruins a burger more than a juicy slab of tomato And and the nastiest condiment ever created on planet Earth, mayonnaise. So if I order a burger and I say I want no mayo, no tomato, But I get home and find that not only is there tomato and mayo, but they heard me say extra tomato and extra mayo. I I literally have to suppress a gag reflex as I scrape that stuff off of my burger. Now, I know that that is something small, but I went into the meal expecting one thing, and then I got another. Maybe you have entered into an agreement, maybe a legal agreement, And you had come to terms verbally with the conditions of the agreement. The papers were drawn up and you signed your name on the document only to find out that the verbal agreement and what was written down differed. And maybe it was just a few words, but those words made a big difference and you signed your name on the dotted line and you were stuck with the agreement. Now that's a little bit more serious than tomatoes and mayo. Perhaps it's even a little closer to home. Maybe you married someone that turned out to be somebody altogether different than the person you dated. You thought you were getting one thing, but you got something else altogether. And so you find yourself living life day to day, not with what you expected, not with who you expected, but with almost like a a stranger that's embodied this person that you thought you were marrying. So these things can be infuriating. They can be difficult. They can be hard. They can be messy. And the solutions are not always easy. I want to take us back to last week. In Joshua chapter 9, uh, Pastor Rick uh, spoke to us about the Gibeonites. And he knocked that out of the park. Go back and watch it. Uh, they were neighbors of the Israelites. And They feared Israel, and they knew that Israel was going to overtake them, so they pulled a fast one on Joshua and his people. They they put together a delegation of people. They put them in old clothes. They put them in worn-out sandals with cracked wineskins, and they positioned themselves, or they presented themselves as people from a faraway nation who who had heard about the strength of Israel's God, and they wanted to be allies with Israel. And they they assured Joshua and the leaders that they were from a a long way off. Now, the scripture basically tells us is the Israelites, they sniffed that something was off, but the delegation, they deserved Oscar awards because they sold it hard. In Joshua 9, 14 and 15, Going back to last week, it says, The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. And so, unknowingly, Joshua and Israel made a neighboring enemy an accidental ally. They thought they were making a deal with a a people from a long way 
off, but they had sealed the deal and they would have to keep their end of the bargain. And that basically brings us to our, our story and our scripture text for today. It's in Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. It has all kinds of uh, strange names that I'm, I'm bound to mispronounce a few of them. Now, Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I, and its men were good fighters. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites, now these are the, these are the, the award-winning actors that they kind of suckered Joshua and Israel, sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us. Because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Now listen to this. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makadah. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day of the on the, day of, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, sun stand, sun stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it, before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now, that was a lot of names and a lot of places and a lot of action going on. So here's the summary. I know some of you got through college on Cliff's Notes. You, you people were hard for me to, to tolerate, but you did it. So here you go. Here are the Cliff Notes. The king of Jerusalem, he rounded up a bunch of other kings, and they decide to attack Gibeon. And basically, the king of Gibeon shoots Joshua a text message, and he says, hey, come quick. We're under attack, and oh, by the way, don't forget, we're allies. We need you to come save us. And I'm guessing that everything inside of Joshua wanted to snooze on that message, wanted to totally ghost the, the king of, of Gibeon, because he, he didn't want any part of this, I'm guessing. But he didn't do that. He, he honored the agreement that they made. And so he, he gathers his fighting men, and they march all night. And common sense would say that once you've marched all night, you need to rest a little bit before you go into a battle. But God assures them of the victory, and they surprise the armies, and they end up routing them. And at the end of that, we see that the sun stands still, but that God acted on behalf of his people. Now, here's, here's the point. And I think for a lot of years, I, I, I really missed the point of this because I would have read this text and I would have tried to, to prove somehow that the, the sun stood still. But at the end of the day, that isn't, 
the, the point of what happened here. The point is that God showed up on behalf of his people and he did God things that only God could do. God showed up and he fought with them and for them and he did things for them that they had, could have never done in their own strength. See, Jacob and his army were, were present. They listened, they trusted, and then God moved on their behalf. Now, as we finish up this series, Courage Over Fear, I wonder if we have situ situations going on where we need to simply show up, be present, listen to God, act in obedience, and allow God to do God things on our behalf. Allow God to do God-sized things in our relationships with others, in our hearts, in our minds, in the deepest parts of us that need healing. The kindest way that, that I can say this, this next part, is that, that I was having an absolutely crappy couple of days earlier this week. And, and I was a, a ball of emotions. I, I had been rude to my family. And one night, I believe it was Sunday night, I, it had just been kind of a disaster and it was my fault. I, I went to bed after dinner uh, to spare them basically from me and, and from my attitude and, and my mouth. And, and, and so I woke up the next morning and I, honestly, I still wasn't like feeling it. I was... I was just uneasy on the inside with everything that's going on in our world. And I put on my headphones and I went to YouTube and I pulled up this Resonate worship service that our team put together recently. And I just put it on repeat. And many of you know that my, my wife sings here and it the very beginning of this service, she began to share about this song that they were going to sing called Surrounded. And one of the lyrics is, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And she began to share of how there have been times in our life when we, we look at it through human eyes. It, it seems as though God is, is nowhere to be found in our situation, but when we look back, we can see that, that he was there all along. And while it seemed like we were surrounded by all of the problems, in reality, we were surrounded by God who had gone before us and was fighting battles on, on our behalf, even in the mess, even in the hard, even in the difficult seasons of life that we found ourselves. And then there's this, this lyric that's taken straight from Psalm 23. This says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And then it goes on, it says, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. And so I went back and I actually pulled up an old sermon that, that I had preached. And I looked at that specific set of words. And I was reminded that, that many times the shepherd would go ahead of his flock. In the, the winter months or the early spring, he would make his way up the mountain to the plateaus. And he would begin to prepare the land for the flock that was not going to be there for, for weeks or even a few more months. He would, he would spread minerals and he would prepare the pasture for the day that they eventually got there. And he would do this with the, the animals of prey peering down on that plateau. So he would literally prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I was reminded that, that God, is, he is working and he is, he is wanting to work in ways that, that we don't even know, that we can't even imagine, that we can't even conceptualize, that, that he is not only with us, but he is doing God things in the background. I told you we were going to keep things simple today. And I want to close uh, this preaching time by just being really, really honest with you and, and sharing with you an area in my life that God has shown up, that he has done 
some God-sized stuff. When, when I was willing to be present and listen and allow him to do God-sized things in my life. And sometimes it wasn't just a quiet time where God spoke to me. He used people in my life who had a different set of experiences than I have ever had to speak truth. And eventually that truth landed in, in me and began to transform the way in which I viewed the world. Now, I love that in January, Rick stood before this church when we were still gathering together, and he said, uh, our vision for 2020 is that we are, are going to preach with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Like, we are not going to back away from, from issues that, that are out there, because the, the kingdom of God, the, the Holy Spirit, requires that, that we not back away from difficult stuff. And I love that that was said in January, because I, I'm about to lean into that. Now, I want you to understand, I grew up in a suburb of Atlanta. I grew up in a, a southern culture where racism wasn't recognized for what it was. In fact, if you would have asked me, like, Levi, are, are you a racist? I would say, no, I'm not a racist. I, I condemn the KKK and white supremacy, and uh, there's a black kid in my class, and we sit right now. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. But, but I grew up in, in the South in a culture where you could easily hear comments like this. He sure is articulate for a black man. It's really strange that she's black because she doesn't act black. I would hear those comments and I wouldn't think that there was anything racist in them at the time. I was against affirmative action. I didn't understand why there were organizations that were set up for blacks only. I, I was completely unaware that the system at large was set up for white people. We just didn't have it in the name. I recently had a conversation with a high school classmate, and he reminded me of an excuse that I made as to why he was faster than me. And he told me, he said, I never had a problem admitting that you were a better soccer player than me. It just bugged me that there had to be an excuse as to why I was faster than you that was tied to my race. Ooh. I said something 27, 28 years ago that this man had not forgotten. Thankfully, I was able to apologize. And he said, you know what? It's all good. It's water under the bridge. So what I want to do is uh, I just want to read something that I wrote. It was a Facebook post that, that I penned after the Ahmad Arbery murder in, in Georgia. And I'm just going to read it to you. It says, this will be long and it's difficult to put out there. It's a bit of my awakening to the reality of racism and the privilege I have because of the color of my skin. I watched the video of Ahmad's murder two days ago. It physically made me nauseous. I started to move the cursor over the stop control when I realized what I was about to see. I didn't want to see it, but I didn't stop. I watched as a young man out on a jog was gunned down for doing something my kids have done many times in our own neighborhood. If he was white, I'm convinced he would still be alive. My elementary and middle school years were spent in an almost exclusively white suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. There were less than a dozen black peers in my ninth grade class of several hundred students. Halfway through my freshman year, we moved to Clarksville, Tennessee over the Christmas break. It was a military town, and fortunately, I was thrust into a multiracial social environment as I had never known. I distinctly remember my black classmates calling me by name in the hallway because of some success I had had with soccer. And I had to respond, thanks man, thanks bro. Not because I didn't know their names, but because I couldn't tell these friends apart. I don't know what I could have done to change that, but I know I didn't do this with my white peers. Thank God this changed over time, and I'm so thankful it did. Looking back, it was the first time I ever saw my whiteness. 
As I began playing soccer and football, I was able to call many of my black classmates, friend, and teammate. And I remember in the early 90s that that several of these teammates would use the phrase and the N-word when greeting each other. In my naivete, I thought it would be fine for me to do so as well. Thankfully, I, I had a friend, John Joshua, who with great kindness and gentleness told me that as a white person, I should never use that as a way of greeting or never use the word ever again. It was only to be used between people of color. I listened and never used the term again. To this day, I'm grateful for his honesty. Now fast forward to my college years. I was blessed to play soccer with one of the most talented goalkeepers I have ever known. His name is Eric Green. He was a dreadlocked terror in the goal on the soccer field, but easy as a summer breeze with an infectious smile and gregarious laugh off the field. And our school was located just 30 minutes from the Okoe River. And in the springtime, a bunch of us would often head over for some fun in the river. I distinctly remember him saying to us, we have got to be out of Polk County before the sun sets. I don't want to be anywhere near this place after dark. I didn't know what he was talking about. But he was distinctly aware that it was a dangerous place to be as a black man when night fell. It was fear that I had never known and to this day have still not known. He awakened me to the reality that people of color have to be vigilant in where they go and don't go. And it it sickens me to this day. My beautiful niece, McKaylee, because of the color of her skin, will make her way through life playing by a different set of rules. My sister moved them to Colorado to escape the blatant racism they experienced publicly in her early years of living in the South. She hasn't even fully escaped it there. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that Her heart rate will elevate throughout her life as she lives and breathes and has her being in ways that my kid's heart rate never will. And I close this way. To each of my friends of color, I love you. I'm sorry for the times I have been silent in the past. I'm sorry for the ways in which our lives are different when they should be the same. I'm sorry for the ways I was arrogant and dogmatic in my youth. Forgive me. Today we walk, today we mourn, today we donated, today we are grateful that the men who perpetrated, perpetrated this crime have been arrested. Today we pray for justice. And so sometimes we have to be willing to show up and listen and allow God to do God-sized things in us. We have to have the courage to stand up and say what is right, no matter who it may offend. And that, that post offended some people, some people that reacted so strongly that I had to delete the comment. I had to block them as a friend. But it was also received in ways that that I never expected by friends from 20 years ago who have continued to reach out and say, thank you. Thank you for making it clear where you stand on this issue. So this is what I'm learning in life. It's to be grateful that God is so good at doing something altogether different than what we expect He shows up and does things. He allows us to find victory in embarrassing areas of our life. And he shows us a better way to be fully alive. And so I wonder, what is the area? What is the issue? What is the relationship in your life that will require you to place courage over fear so that God can show up and do things that only he can do in that area, in that issue, in that relationship. 
What is the thing that we fear so much that it wins out over courage time and time again? Is it fear of of losing control? You probably aren't as in control as you think you are. Is it the fear of having to admit that you've been wrong? Yeah, I've been there. I've done that. Is it a fear of what you might discover about yourself if you head down this path of allowing God to show up in your life and do God-sized things? Is it a fear that things will get worse before they get better if you head down this path? Some of us literally need courage to win the victory over fear in our life so we can become unstuck, so that we can move on in life and not be stuck in this place that we have been for so long. I'm so grateful that today is the first Sunday of the month, that that it's a communion Sunday, that, that we're going to close our time together this morning at the common table. The table that has no regard for your greatness or your weakness. No regard for your wealth or your poverty. No regard for your power or your vulnerability, your accomplishments, nor your failures. This table has no regard for the color of your skin. And so today we're going to eat of this meal together We're going to be reminded that in Jesus' day, all of Jerusalem was expecting one kind of king, yet they got another. They expected power and might, and they got sacrificial love and death and resurrection, and they got a new kind of kingdom all together. The kingdom that came with Jesus that began in his life, his death, was born in his resurrection. The same kingdom that we're invited to be a part of. There's no difference between men and women, Jews and Gentile, slaves and masters. (laughs) This table equalizes it for all of us, every single one of us, can come to this table not because we deserve it, but because we have a king that embraced suffering and embraced death when he could have avoided it all. pray that this time together can be with your family, a time where you're honest, where you give voice to the things that you're afraid of in life, to the places that you need God to show up, that you need him to surround you with his love, his grace, his ability to do things that you have no idea that he can do for you. In Mark chapter 14, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And then... He took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. This is his body 
in his blood. Take and eat. Take and drink. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that in your kingdom there is special attention given to those who are oppressed, those who live in the margins, those who are overlooked. God, forgive us when we knowingly or unknowingly participate in systems that continues to push people into the margins. Forgive us. Come and have your way in each and every one of us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Church, hear these words. It's a prayer written by a, a pastor acquaintance in Nashville. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's from Psalm 139. Search me, God, for any racist thoughts, words, or deeds. Search me, God, for any white supremacy that has left a mark on my soul. Search me, God, for ways that I shelter racism in my relationships, community, and the institutions I serve. Search me, God, for resistance to the work of the Spirit in the cries of my black brothers and sisters. See if there is any way in me that does not lead to a world where black lives truly matter. And lead me to actively pursue your everlasting kingdom here on earth. Amen. Grace Church, it's time to get to work.